Hello and welcome to Healing Tips from the Heart, Intuition with Helpers, Healers, and Guides. I am your host, Dr. Lori Hopps, licensed psychologist, writer, and artist. I've explored mind, body, and spirit related to intuition, or your personal guidance system, since early childhood. Meet my guests who have learned from their personal and professional lives to explore vast realms of knowing, synchronicities, and overcoming challenges. Their stories may inspire you with tools to enhance your daily living and relationships. Hello, everyone, and welcome my special guest for today, Judith A. Swack, PhD. She is the originator of a technique, a school called Healing from the Body Level Up, which we'll be talking more about. And this is a methodology methodology that she has created. She is trained in biochemistry and immunology. She's also a master neurolinguistic program practitioner, a certified hypnotherapist, mind-body healer, and she is absolutely a visionary and leader in the field of energy psychology. Dr. Swack has presented her dramatic results live on national television and at international conferences, and she is widely published with articles in scientific, professional, and popular journals. Dr. Swack is the recipient of the 2015 ASEP Award for Major Contribution to the Field of Energy Psychology, and she offers trainings both nationally and abroad, and she has a private practice in Needham, Massachusetts. So welcome, welcome, Judith. It's so good to see you, and thank you for being here today. Well, thank you, Lori. You know, I just think you're a very delightful being, and I always enjoy talking with you. (laughs) Thank you. I'd like the audience to know that I met you through ASEP, the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology, and we actually had um, uh, some really cool interactions when we were at a retreat together (laughs) in the middle of the high desert in New Mexico in Chaco Canyon. Which, um, you know, so there was kind of like a, a really cool, went beyond the professional into the personal and spiritual domain. So really, it's so lovely to have you here today. Yes, I asked Lori for hints about uh, teaching people how to use their psychic abilities in my instant intuition class that I teach at uh, Community Education. And she teaches intuition classes. And so she gave me some books and some ideas and we brainstormed. It was very synergistic. Yes. And then we had some personal moments too to say, let's try some stuff out and play. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> it was great. So um get two psychic healers together and of course they have to play. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um is there anything else you'd like the listeners and watcher of uh, you know, washers <laughs> to um people who are watching to know about you? Yeah, um, I started out as a biomedical scientist and I thought I was going to be a doctor. And my mother always knew that I was going to be some kind of magical scientist healer. Mm. And I said, how did you know that? Because she knew when I was three years old, that's what I was going to be. I said, how did you know that, mom? She said, because you were curious. I said, mom, all children are curious. Not like you, she said. You have <laughs> to dissect everything. You asked a thousand questions. You have to know everything about it from every angle. No. So when I was in college, I wanted to go to medical school. And I asked my professors for, and I was pre-med, I asked my professors for letters of recommendation. And my professor of organic chemistry said, He really didn't think I should go to medical school, that I would be wasted there because Mm. I have a research mind and it's a rare gift and I should do research and get a PhD and and advance the field of study that I'm in. Mm -hmm. But I applied and didn't get in. So, of course, my first job was in a biochemistry lab. And a year later, I went to apply to medical school again, even though I didn't feel like it anymore because I really love doing research. And I asked 
uh, the MD PhD who was collaborating with me in that lab if he would write a letter of recommendation and he shouted at me and said I will not and I was like what he said you'd be wasted as a doctor you have a research mind it's a rare gift and you should get a degree in biomedical science mm. and and further the field that you're in mm. at which point having heard it twice and <laughs> loudly <laughs> I uh basically got a PhD in biochemistry and did research. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to do immunology research, which was my favorite field, and I'm going to advance the field because mm -hmm. that's what you do when you have a PhD. It's a research degree, and you add new things and advance the field. But, of course, guidance, yes? Guidance directs you. So even though you think you're going in one direction – if you if you're stubborn and you don't pay attention, you get hit over the head with a two by four and course corrected. <laughs> yeah. So I had started doing mind body healing uh, when I was 30 and I was um, in the process of getting my Ph.D. Because my love life was terrible mm. and I couldn't understand why I kept attracting the same emotionally unavailable man in different bodies. Mm -hmm. So look where I pointed I can't figure it out. I'm an intelligent woman. Why can't I figure out what I'm doing? And then one of my um, dates actually suggested that I take a self-help workshop. Hmm. So I took, uh, I took. Was this like a, was this like pity advice? <laughs> I, I, it was just sincere advice. I don't, I don't think he had an attitude. He just really thought it would be helpful. Nice guy. Gave me an idea. Okay. So I took actualizations and I was introduced to the unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know there was such a thing because I was unconscious of it, of course. <laughs> and at the time, as a scientist, I really thought the purpose of the body was to carry your head around. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, you've met these scientists. Okay. A walking head. Yes. Yeah. So then I realized, because I am a very bright person, that the reason I was attracting the same pattern is because it was in my unconscious mind and it needed to be healed. Yeah. And then I, then it, I felt a great relief that there was nothing wrong with my intelligence. I was just looking in the wrong place and I didn't have the tools. Yeah. So I asked them, the trainers, how, you know, how you do what you do. And they said, we're trained in neuro linguistic programming. And I'm like, okay. So I trained in neuro linguistic programming and there I learned tools and methods for accessing the unconscious mind and then healing what I call the damage patterns that were causing me results that I wasn't happy with. And while I was in that training, now remember, I really thought I was going to be an immunologist and I was just doing this for my personal life. So I thought. Mm -hmm. And second semester, two of my classmates came up to me at a break and said they wanted to work with me privately. And I'm thinking to myself, what? I'm a, I'm a scientist. I wear a lab coat. I work with chemicals. I don't work with people. I said, what are you talking about? I don't even have an office. I couldn't even imagine sitting in street clothes across from somebody in a chair in an office. That's not a lab, right? And I literally went like, like this, go away. <laughs> I said, the trainers can help you. They know what they're doing. Yeah. And so they tightened up and said to me, no, we want to work with you. Mm -hmm. And this woman said, and you can use my office, which is five minutes from your apartment in the evenings after, after your work. So, and then she said, and furthermore, my husband wants to work with you. And he shares the office suite. And this man said, and furthermore, my son wants to work with you. He's, I'm divorced. He's living with me. Wow. So I said, no, go away. I don't even have an office. And the universe said, yeah, here's the office. And now you have four clients. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I went like this. And I, I realized that um, I'm very good at it. I enjoy it. And so I, and then they weren't going away. So I said, okay, 
we'll see what happens. So I started treating them, very successful. It's very good at NLP, very powerful methodology. Yeah. And then they started referring people to me. So I would see people two nights a week and then work in the lab all week. And then I, I got my PhD and moved to Boston where I started my practice here. Mm-hmm. Well, I was in the lab working to be an immunologist. And then uh, I met my husband and he learned NLP and we learned how to communicate. And I still thought I was going to be an immunologist and my healing business was like a hobby on the yeah. side. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I kept developing the work and learning, taking classes and adding things and organizing things and, and finding structures and, and developing the work like a research scientist does. And at some point, I didn't get my grant renewed in academia. And so I went to I went to um, I went to business and worked in a in a company for a while. And then I had a baby and couldn't do everything at once. And at mm-hmm. this point, I was seeing six clients a week and working full time. So I just said, "Where does this package best serve the collective?" And I thought, well, not too many people have developed a healing methodology that works scientifically and reproducibly and is very powerful, and they can always hire another biochemist. So I quit the lab, and I went from six clients a week to 20 clients a week in three months. Wow. And continued. And so um, I guess I was called, and every time I tried to go in a different direction, I was course corrected. And so this is what I've done. Beautiful. Thank goodness people are so uh, persistent (laughs) when they need to be and that you listen. I listened. Well, I did put up the goal one time. um, Stop getting hit over the head with a two by four. And I cleared a, I cleared a blockage and now I pay attention to the signs. Yes. And I found that the more I do HBLU work on myself, because I treat myself for something almost every day just to stay clean, Mm -hmm. the more psychic I get. Okay. Makes sense. You're more plugged in. Mm -hmm. The super highway. I always say like a high high speed track, a little pebble can cause a big problem. Not when you're walking, but if you're going fast, you need a smooth, clean surface when you're going at a high speed. And so it's like... um, the more the more you clear the debris, the, the smoother the ride can be. Yeah, that's what I found. And I also found that um, I think that's cute about the sensitivity because I'll, I'll pick up a interference pattern or a damage pattern that's interfering in my field at like 1% uh-huh. and I'll feel it. Yep. Like something doesn't feel right. It's 1% interference. And so I started joking that I'm the princess and the pea. Yes. Because I can feel the pea under the 10 mattresses. Right. And, you know, and we applaud people who have that kind of um, fine-tuned nervous system, psyche, mental space as being, you know, um, great artists or scientists, Um, people who have an incredible sensitivity with the sense of smell, can work for perfume manufacturers Mm -hmm. or companies, Mm -hmm. creations, artists that know thousands of variations of color so, right right yeah so hblu is a methodology it's not a technique it's a whole method and it has a life of its own it 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 grows itself i feel like i'm the secretary you know i take the notes yeah. of what comes to me and what shows itself and then i write protocols like lab protocols so that people who train with me and I do train people in HBLU can follow the protocols and get the same results I did. Mm -hmm. So, so when I work with somebody, it's my soul connecting to their soul and their soul, their deepest wisdom leads the healing. And we use muscle testing to connect in with their inner levels. And we muscle test and ask their deepest wisdom. What's the highest priority goal Then we ask what's interfering on the goal. And at this point, I have menus of patterns that we can find. And I have a menu of 52 techniques that work at different levels. We have the conscious level, the unconscious level, 
the body and the soul. And so you want to match the right protocol with the right technique. And I build protocols the way I do any laboratory protocol. Step one, do this. Step two, add this. Step three, do this. Step four, shake it. And step five, it comes out like this. Mm -hmm. Very like a recipe. Like a recipe. Mm -hmm. So the recipes get built by what people show me. And it isn't just what people show me because sometimes I'll be working with somebody. I'll have no idea what's going on because they're showing me something I don't recognize it already. They don't have enough awareness or language to know what it is either. And suddenly I'll hear guidance or some idea will just pop in. Yep. And then so, you have another piece of the puzzle that you didn't have from your mental state or theirs. Right. So anytime I get information, I still muscle test the client to find out if the information I'm getting is right. And their soul will tell us. Because the thing is, you can't find something if you don't know how to ask for it. So the soul can't really tell you unless you ask correctly. But when I find something, I test it. So that's how I know that my psychic uh, information is accurate, is I'll get, I'll get a, a read or I'll get an impression, I'll get a piece of information, mm -hmm. and I'll tell the client what I'm getting, and then I'll muscle test their deepest wisdom to see if what I'm getting is is right. And their soul will tell me, yes, that's exactly right, and this is what we need to work on. Great. For those who don't know, do you mind just briefly describing muscle testing? Okay, so you've all heard of lie detector testing. You know that when somebody goes to a police station and they want to give them a lie detector test, they hook them up to some uh, sensors, and then they ask them true and false questions, and they can measure the autonomic uh, response of the body through the sensors. So a true question, they'll get, um, and they have a chart paper, so they have a, a graph paper they can measure. So a true question, uh, they might get some, something like this, and a false question, they might get something like this so they can read true and false through the body signals. So for those who are only listening, can you describe what the signals are? Uh, some of our guests are only audio, so they're not seeing your fingers move. Oh, so if you have chart paper, I don't know if anybody has ever seen an EKG. Or the earthquake me uh, measurements. Right. So there's a chart paper that runs through the machine and there are sensors and there's a uh, there's a pen, a floating pen. And when you get a certain signal coming in, the floating pen will mark the chart paper as it's rolling under the pen. And the uh, pen can can roll um, different heights and different degrees and different repetitions so that you can see uh, the the uh, height of the scribble and the, the depth of the scribble, and the, the width of the scribble. So that's what they use to measure answers in a lie detector machine. So they will out, they'll calibrate the machine by asking you known true questions and you answer true and the, the pen moves in a certain way and makes a certain mark on the paper. Then they'll ask questions and ask you to deliberately lie, give a false answer, and they'll see that the pen moves in a different way and, and makes a different signal on the chart paper. Mm -hmm. So what we know is that your autonomic nervous system can will give a different signal for yes and a different signal for no just through the body. And you don't use the graph paper. I don't bother because I can use muscle testing to get the same answers. So muscle testing, I have people hold out their arms towards me and I tell their conscious mind to send the questions into the body and you have to ask true false questions, obviously, because you're getting true false answers. Mm -hmm. So the trick is to ask a short question, only one question at a time and very clean so that it's not ambiguous. So uh, we'll send a question into the body and I'll press on the arms 
And typically the arms will hold strong for a yes or true, and they'll go weak or go down for a false or a no. And I can teach people how to self muscle test. I typically use the standing tilt test. And on the standing tilt, they stand up, they relax their whole bodies, particularly around the knees and ankles. And then we'll say, body, show us a yes signal because we're calibrating the machine. And typically they'll tilt forward on the yes and then come back to center and body, show us a no signal and they'll go back on the no. So at the beginning of every session, we calibrate the machine, meaning the body signals for true and false <clears throat> so that we can read the body signals and the body signals will give us the answers from your unconscious mind and your body and your soul. So you can specify where you're sending the questions and the body will read out the answers to you. Beautiful. And what I found is that you consciously can't access these answers uh, any other way. I haven't found a better way to access these accurately. You use pendulum? So, uh, I can, but I don't. Okay. The reason that I don't use a pendulum, although a pendulum will swing in one direction for yes and in a different direction for no, so that you can read it. But the reason that I don't use a pendulum is because it can be manipulated by dark side entities and give you false answers. Uh, and you don't find that the body does not? The body does not. Okay. Although I do, check, I do check for deception, but the body will give me accurate answers and I can check for deception if I suspect there's an entity. Interesting. Oh, what a beautiful explanation. Thank you. I can see how your mind works. Uh, just, <laughs> yeah, you know, the yeah the with the specificity, the detail, you did a great job drawing out with your words, mm -hmm. you know, the lie detector test and all the rest. So thank you for that. It's so, so very clear. Well, in working with this ever evolving methodology, um, have you found things that were surprising to you? Oh, like oh dramatically um, surprising. Oh, yes. Dramatically surprising. And uh, maybe things that were also high, highly useful that you wouldn't have suspected. Totally. And then it became part, that's right. And then it became part of the methodology. Okay. Do you have any story that kind of jumps out that you might want to share? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of them. So I was muscle testing a client to find out what, what her Enneagram type was. And the Enneagram is a personality typing system like the Myers-Briggs or astrology, it's their personality typing systems. This one has nine different types. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered through muscle testing is that your type comes in with you at conception. So when the soul enters the body, your Enneagram type gets downloaded with it and it acts as your operating system, like the operating system of a computer. So the soul is the higher mind. It comes into the body, which is the hardware, the unconscious mind is the software and the ego structure is the operating system like Windows or, you know, Mac operating systems. Mm -hmm. So she muscle tested that she had two different Enneagram types. Oh. And that isn't actually possible because the operating system gets not done with the soul. So I checked for deception. I muscle tested several times. I had her drink water. She didn't have any blocks in her energy field. It was a clean answer. So now I'm going, what does that mean? So I blurted out, so what? There's more than one soul occupying this body? Yes, I have chills. And My the answer body was- said yes. <laughs> and the answer was yes. <laughs> So then I muscle tested, really? <laughs> yes. yes. Really. <laughs> and then I'm like, what do we do with that? <laughs> Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So then I muscle tested, well, <clears throat> is it ever allowed to have more than one soul occupying a body? No. Oh. So we have to release this extra soul? Yes. Okay. Now what? Hmm. So now I'm off asking a thousand questions yeah and then it turns out well i asked was the soul invited whose idea was it was it yours was it the souls you see i start going to 100 questions yeah 
And it turns out it was the client's unconscious mind because I checked all the levels. Who invited them? And then we asked their unconscious mind, how many reasons did it have for inviting this soul? And we actually mapped out the reasons and muscle tested and got a whole storyline here. And then what do we do with this soul? And it turns out that you have two choices, depending on the soul and depending on why the unconscious mind invited it to stay. And by the way, it was never the other soul's idea, but it agreed to it. Oh. So I even asked that. Uh-huh. So it ended up that um, you have two choices. Usually the unconscious mind invites the soul to stay with them if they can't bear the loss and they don't want to be alone. And they invite that person to stay with them. And out of love, that person stays with them. So it's it's pretty sentimental. Yeah. But again, the problem is if you have two souls in the body and you can only have one soul in there at a time, because I checked that, then when the other soul's in the body, your soul's outside. And when your soul's in, they're outside. So if you want to lead your life and follow your own path with your own deepest wisdom, it's confusing if some other soul's taking over on their path and not yours. Right. Is a problem. Yep. So we either release the other soul while having a little goodbye ritual. Thank you for coming. This is what you meant to me. I'll treasure you always. And it requires Kleenex. So I have Kleenex yeah. written. Or it may be that it's for their highest good for each soul, for that soul to stay on this side, but join the guide team. They just can't share the body. Okay. Which is fine. So like a, a dimensional shift, but still yeah. with the uh, connection, the attachment. Right. So, you know, if their grandmother, who's the only safe person who ever loved them, <clears throat> died and left them to their abusive family, <clears throat> you can understand why the unconscious mind invited grandma to stay with me. Don't leave. Yeah. Right. You can understand why grandma would stay. Yep. But by the time they come into my office, I usually work with adults. And they don't need grandma anymore. And right. So, or sometimes they still do, in which case she can stay. And I tell people that everybody has a minimum of one angel, one guardian angel, and one guide per lifetime. And so they do have a guide team. And um, and so grandma can join their guide team and can talk to them and give them advice, just can't be in the body. That's yeah. all. Yep. Yeah. Technical detail. Yep. Yeah. It would have been more confusing if both had the same Enneagram number. There's only nine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, just to cover the ass on that, I do check <laughs> even if they say there's only one soul in the body. No, even if they say they're only one Enneagram type, I still ask, is there more than one soul occupying this body regardless? Okay. All right. And that's a good point. See, I like how you think. Yep. Think outside right? the box. And also, yeah. we could possibly go wrong. <laughs> Right, right. When you first started telling the story, which I hadn't heard before, I immediately thought of a twin. Um, and so the image that I got was, which I don't know if this is true for the uh, history of this individual, but that there was a, a twin that died uh, mm. or a twin that was going to incarnate and decided not to. So it's this notion of wanting that closeness, that intimacy mm -hmm. of the other within you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, and it could be that, that, uh, the two souls were, um, so close, almost like a twin. So. I have seen people. Yeah. I've seen people, the extra soul was, uh, the soul of the baby they aborted. Yeah. Yeah. And you can understand the unconscious mind sentimental reasoning for that. Usually when you find out who it is, it's obvious why it was invited. Yeah. You know, rarely do we have to specifically map out. And why did you invite this? Me? Right, right. Sometimes you'll get somebody who's really mean and awful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my my alcoholic, abusive father died. And I, I invite him to, to stay with me. Why? Because we never resolved it. We never worked it out. And I'm not letting go of him till we do. Yeah. All right, then. Well, fine. But a healthier way to get there. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. Wow. I just found out my Enneagram. People thought I was a certain number and I'm not. <laughs> oh, okay. You have to muscle test the soul. Only the soul knows where you center on the Enneagram. And you have to ask the question like that. Remember, since this is true, false, you have to word the questions very precisely. Yeah. 
Well, I'm, as you're talking, I'm asking because I can do muscle testing and I'm asking. So, is, so ask I asked, is the test that I took accurate for my soul? Yes. Is there another number that's accurate? No. Okay. Right. So, and I ask it, is that the center of your type? Is that your central type? Yes. Right. Because in that system, people overlap five out of nine of the types. Because let's say you're an Enneagram one, you'll overlap the two, which is the wing next to you, or the nine, which is the other side, you'll overlap. Yeah. And, and then there's the arrows. Under stress, you go to, if you're yeah. a, if you're a one, you go to four, you arrow to four. And if you're secure, you go to seven. So, so when people take the test consciously, and they will give answers that they're consciously aware of, that they have yeah. this characteristic and that characteristic. So they may not actually get the center of their type. They might recognize themselves as a related type because they have a lot of those characteristics. So I have people take an Enneagram test. And in my mind, I just know they're ballparking it. And then I muscle test to ask, where's the center of your type? Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Thank so you. Precision. And nobody outside of you can type you. Okay. By looking at you. I mean, yeah. This, I mean, it's amazing how wrong people are. <laughs> I I haven't been told I'm every single member, but <laughs> many of them. <laughs> right. So anyway, um, that's so cool. Yeah. I love all that. You know, um, your, your respect for the integrity of the methodology mm -hmm. of seeing it, I'm going to use my words as a living system. Um, of intelligence and divine wisdom maybe mm -hmm. um, is so precious and um, I have so much respect for the ethics and that you display with this um, that it is not this ego-based thing like you know look at the thing the shiny thing I created you know you're like you were invited um, mm -hmm. really against your uh, desires plan maybe even better judgment um, to kind of follow into this land that is very much the scientist explorer land, but not with immunology or cell biology or something. Yeah. Right. right. So right. thank you for that. Uh, I don't really think I had a choice. Just saying. Yeah. But, you always have choice. Well. But maybe you wouldn't have been as happy with the choices that you made. Yeah, probably not. And as I said, I cleared the uh, getting need to get hit hit over the head with a two by four. So I just <laughs> I, when I get the signs, I flow gracefully now, and I haven't been hit over the head for like twenty years. I'm like, yeah. okay, here's the sign. I'm going to follow this. Here's the sign. I'm going to follow it. And yeah. I may not like it, by the way. Mm -hmm. I think you made a good point. I may not like where I'm being directed. Yeah. You know, from my whatever conscious mind point of view or my attitude point of view or what I think is real point of view. But remember, you know, in neurolinguistic programming, you learn that everybody makes their own individual maps of reality, none of which is real. It's just how you've interpreted everything. Mm -hmm. So I sort of go into higher consciousness and read the signs and go where I'm called, whether I, you know, my ego self likes it or not, but there's a soul, you know, my soul is my true self. And this is just an, a version of my embodiment, right? I, yep. This is my current avatar, basically, for my soul. And so, you know, we're all these three-dimensional beings, but, it's you know, this is not my true self. This happens to be my incarnation and this form and this ego structure for this lifetime. And then my soul goes on and, and re-embodies or becomes something else. Uh, I remember talking to... My angel and guide. Oh, that's a funny story. How I, how I, so <clears throat> I was still working at Seba Corning Diagnostics and I was writing a report and it was seven o'clock at night and I was using somebody else's computer because it was better than mine. And I was hungry. You have to understand I'm hungry. When I get hungry, I have to eat. I'm like, oh, I have to eat. So mm -hmm. I was, hungry. so a janitor came by who I'd never seen before. And he pauses and he says, well, you must be important because you have more than one office. And I'm like, how does he know this isn't my office? Probably because there was a nameplate with a man on it outside the office. I'm like, so I joked and I said, well, I am 
uh, the president of the company and I can use any office I want. <laughs> so much for no ego. <laughs> Right. I have a sense of absurd for my sense of humor. So I, I exaggerate and go absurd. So I heard his unconscious mind, because I, I, I was already psychic. I heard his unconscious mind say that he hated what he was doing and mm -hmm. he didn't want to be a janitor. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to engage. Remember, I'm hungry. I want to finish my report and go home and eat supper. So I heard him say this psychically, but I didn't answer him verbally. So I'm like, so... I, I turn back to my computer and then he says out loud, yes, but I hate what I'm doing and I don't want to be a janitor. And what you're doing is more important than what I'm doing. Wow. He said it out. I heard it. Yeah. I didn't want to address it. He said it out loud. Now what I'm going to do. Yeah. So I turned back to him and I said, yes, but you're a musician, aren't you? No, first I said, all work is valuable. Like Jack Kerouac on the road. All yeah. work is valuable. And he said, yes, but, you know, not like this. And I said, well, you're a musician, aren't you? And he said, how do you know I'm a musician? And I laughed and said, well, I'm psychic. Uh huh. And he went, oh, well, then what do I play? I said, you play the drums. He goes, oh, my God, I play the drums. How did you know? I go, I'm psychic. Now I told you, I'm psychic. I told you, I'm psychic. Are you not listening? <laughs> <laughs> so then he says, what's my name? Mm -hmm. Now, at that point. Did he cover his nameplate? <laughs> I didn't have a nameplate. Okay. Wearing a flannel shirt with no nameplate. So at that point, my scientific mind stepped in and said, don't answer him because you're going to make a fool of yourself because you have no idea. I mean, it was a lucky guess that, you know, he was a music. He played the drums because usually there's only four instruments that people play and you, you got a, You have a 25% probability of getting it right. But for this, you know, it's going to be a very uh, high, high, high probability you'll get it wrong because there are many, many names. Yeah. So I didn't want to answer him. But then I heard a voice to my right that says his name is Ken. So I say to the voice, I don't want to say this because I could embarrass myself and get it wrong. And he says, tell him his name is Ken. I said, no, I don't want to do it. I'll just embarrass myself. How do I know that his name is Ken? I'm telling you his name is Ken. Just tell him. I know I don't want to do it. Then I hear a voice to my left mm -hmm. that says, his name is Ken. Just tell him. His name. Now I'm hearing two voices <laughs> shouting at me. And so now I'm starting to go like this. <laughs> You're twitching in the chair. <laughs> so, I, so I give up because I'm being shouted at. I thought, well, what the heck? So what if I make a fool of myself? Who cares? Right. I stepped forward and I went, your name is Ken. He said, oh, my God, my name is Ken. <laughs> and he says, he says, nobody's going to believe this. And he runs down the hall to tell his other fellow janitor friends that there's a psychic woman <laughs> who knows nothing about him and told him his name was Ken. So he comes back and he says, they didn't believe me. I'm like, OK, now, remember, I'm hungry. I want to <laughs> finish my report and go home and have dinner. That's my focus. My stomach is my focus. So then he says, what else do you know about me? Oh, no. <laughs> so now I see, I see that he went on a camping trip with a girlfriend who was his height, shoulder length, brown hair. And I said, um, you, just went on, you just went on a camping trip with your girlfriend. He says, oh, my God. Yes, I just went on a camping trip with my girlfriend. So my, my scientific mind said that was a lucky guess that he might like camping because he's wearing a flannel shirt and maybe people who wear flannel go camping. Lucky guess. So I turn to the guy and I say, so do you go camping often? He says, never. And we went this once and we hated it. We're never going again. Mm. At which point I turned to my, so this is my psychic mind. And this is my, you hear the two voices talk to yeah. each other. I turned to this one. And I said, shut up. <laughs> Right. It's like enough, enough. So then he says, what else do you know? I said, listen, really, I'm hungry. I'm trying to finish my report. I want to go home and eat dinner. I'm so sorry. But, you know, he said, oh, I understand. I understand fully. And then he left me alone. I finished. I went home to eat dinner. So on the way home, I'm like, who are these voices? Yeah. Because I don't remember ever hearing them. So I turn and I go, and who are you? And this one says, oh, I'm your right side angel. 
I go, and who are you? He goes, oh, I'm my, I'm your left side guide. Mm. Okay. Then I thought back and I realized that I had been hearing from them, but I just wasn't consciously aware because I would get ideas that mm. would just come to me. And if I thought back about it and paid attention to the direction that the uh, communication came from, which is outside of me, I would have realized that they've been giving me ideas for years. I just thought it, I just thought the ideas just sort of popped in. Right. And so from my awareness, I, ideas would just pop into me. <laughs> yep. And now I know where they were coming from. So ever since that time, I was able to hear their voices. So I go home and I tell my husband, oh, my God. I have a right side, I told him the story. I have a right side angel, left side guy that give me information and tell me, tell me things. Uh, what do you think about that? He says, well, who cares as long as it's useful? Right. I went, oh, good point. And we yep. had dinner. That know, was like, my breakthrough with clients when I started to do this work. How are they ever going to think I'm sane? And yeah, I would just ask them when I got more confident. And they said, I don't care if it comes from the newspaper, your dead grandma or whatever, a dream. If it's going to help me, then I'm going to use the information. So I love that. Yeah, that's so great. You know, there's some research, a small research study on um, embodied intuition that looked at uh, therapists who had an unexpected um, uh, bit of information that came in that helped their client turn a corner and they and and these were body workers, therapists, so uh, uh, somatic psychotherapists, and they uh, interviewed them after the fact. Uh, what was your felt sense as these things were happening, and whether they were aware of it or not? Most of the um, people being interviewed gestured to the right side of the head. Oh. And outside of their body, yeah, right? the yeah. ear. Yes. Right side of the head, near the ear, near the head, probably yep. in line with the shoulder. Yep. Because that's where the voice is coming from. Yeah. That's very cool. Yep. The, the little details that you learn when you're doing a learning lab <laughs> research on for, for ASAP. I had to do some research on that and I found that out. I love the stories that you've shared and I see we're running out of time. And of course... Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I could hang out with you for a long time yeah. <laughs> and not tire of yeah. hearing your wonderful stories and sharing information that we kind of like uh, dovetail in common. Mm -hmm. But is there anything else you'd like to leave us with today? Yeah, I I want people to really realize that their true self is their soul essence. And... It really bothers me. It's a pet peeve of mine when people talk about a behavior like it's an identity. So if somebody... Um, like I'm a smoker? Yes. I hate that. The way I put it is you have a smoking addiction. Right. It's a damage pattern or there might be 10 damage patterns, but it's not your soul. It's a pattern, a pattern in your unconscious mind. Yeah. Or a pattern in your body. And those can be healed. So if you understand. That you are a being, a total being and that your soul is your true self. And that you have to juggle and align and work all your levels together to get the results you want in your life. Then we can go in together and do the healing because you're not sucked into your damage and you're not judging yourself for your damage because it's not an identity. It's just a thing. Mm -hmm. So when people come in to work with me, I train their conscious mind how to be useful. And I tell their conscious mind, you are not the identity. And you cannot speak for the other levels because you don't know what's going on. And in order for you to be useful, I'm going to teach you how to ask the questions and muscle test yourself. And I'm going to teach you techniques that you can use to actually heal these parts when you find them. So conscious mind, think of yourself as Sherlock Holmes. I'm Watson. This is <laughs> HBLU Mystery Theater. <laughs> and the attitude is inquiring minds want to know what's going on in the inner levels. Mm-hmm. Then we're going to muscle test. We're going to use 
Uh, you're going to ask questions. I'm going to ask questions. I have menus of questions. I have menus of patterns. We're going to ask a thousand questions until we find out what's running at what level that's the problem. And once we find out through muscle testing that it's a phobia or a grudge or a past life trauma or a ghost, you know, whatever it is, then your conscious mind turns into Santa Claus. You go down the rabbit hole, connect in with the part of you that's carrying the damage pattern. And I don't care what kind it is. It all boils down to energy, doesn't it? Yeah. It's a stuck energy. It's a stuck energy. And once we find it and we understand with compassion how this part is feeling, then we ask, what's the best technique for clearing it? So Santa Claus says to this part, oh, look, I have just the right thing for you. And Santa Claus opens up his red velvet bag of gifts and reaches in and pulls up just the right technique or just the right protocol, releases the stuck energy. This part heals, integrates into the whole, aligns, and can now do what it came to do in the service of the whole. And this part says, oh, thank you, Santa. I feel so much better. <laughs> and Santa says, you're welcome, honey. Thank you for the milk and cookie. Pats her on the head and then out the chimney, and then next. Yeah. So I train people's conscious minds to not be chauvinistic and not think that they have control over anything because they don't, but to really get into a healing perspective and notice if something isn't working and then ask a bunch of questions and bring healing tools. And I teach everybody tapping because I think that's the most important thing somebody can learn in life is how to use meridian tapping techniques to release trauma from the body and regulate your emotional experience so that you don't get caught up in it or carried away. So people have to watch my tapping video before they come to see me and okay. they walk in and I show them muscle testing yeah. and they're already resourced with something very useful. And then we just go down the chimney and clean out what we find and follow the soul and people get the results they want. Beautiful. And what really tickles me is that we clear things that are supposedly impossible. Yep. And I did a webinar called The Impossible is Not Impossible. And my attitude is everything is easy if you know what you're doing. But again, I've spent four decades figuring out what I'm doing. Right. With help. With a lot of help. With a lot of invisible wisdom. Yeah, I, I just heard um, that you could promote yourself as Dr. Judith's cleaning, soul cleaning service. <laughs> you're not really cleaning the soul, but you're, you're yeah. <laughs> well, we're clearing the being. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. You're, you know, dusting, polishing, getting the, the gunk out, vacuuming, and then, you know, sparkly clean. Exactly. Um, yeah. That's exactly how I think you've been reading my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for sharing your gifts with the world. And um, and I, of course, in the program notes will be all the ways that people can find you. Uh, mm -hmm. So if they want to learn more about your classes or working with you directly or um, watching your videos, all of the rest. And yes, but it's very easy. You just go to hblu.org. Okay, that's it. Right. hblu.org. Right. Yep, that's short for healing from the body level up. Yep. H-E-L-U dot org. Yep. And there you are. There I am. And you can sign up for a free 15 minute consult with me and I can see if I can help you and we can work it out. Super. Oh, thank you so much for this precious time together. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very sweet. Well, and um, you're a blessing to the collective. I want you oh, to. Thank you. Thank you. We all have our missions mm -hmm. and um, we, we find them when the timing is right. Yeah. Whether we know it or not. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's podcast. If you want to learn more, you can visit my website for podcasts and resources at hopshealingtips.com. You can also like, share, and subscribe to this channel. 
This podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and is not providing health care advice. Please seek guidance from your professional health care team should you need assistance.